Ladies and gentlemen, my name's Paul, and in this short game to the com video, we're going to be discussing and analyzing tech news, which, as usual, has popped up over the past 24 or so hours. We're going to start things out with AMD, specifically the Zen 2 architecture, which is found in Rome. Rome, if you're unfamiliar, is the 7NM next generation of EPIC processors, which are aimed at the data center. There has been a lot of questions concerning the performance and naturally the clock speed that we find for this next generation of Zen processors. And we have at least a baseline understanding now of the clock speed jump. Now, there's a couple of things before we start mentioning clocks. The first is that we are not 100% certain whether these clocks are indicative of final retail silicon. It's possible that the final silicon could have higher clock speeds, and these just may be tentative figures. The second thing is that this does not necessarily impact the percentage gain that we are going to be seeing for the desktop variants. And the third thing is these are base clocks. The base clock and the turbo frequencies are two totally different beasts indeed. So let's first of all discuss what we know about this. So the information has come to us through the Hawk supercomputer. That is a joint collaborative effort between HLRS and HPE. And it is, as the name implies, a supercomputer. Now, according to a conference that was held, a presentation, the clock speed is being shown to be 2.35 gigahertz, so 2,350 megahertz. To put that into some level of context, the 8180 processor that AMD pitted the EPIC 2 against, the Rome processor against, in the benchmark demonstration, the uh, CPU of Intel is uh, 2.5 gigahertz for the base, but the original EPIC, such as the 7601 and so on, that has a base clock of 2200 megahertz, but of course has turbo frequencies. So the turbo frequencies of the original EPIC processors uh, is 3.2 gigahertz if it's just a single core that's being pegged to its fullest, and 2.7 gigahertz for an all core. So if you were to do the percentages there, uh, you were looking at about a 22-23% difference between the base clock and an all core turbo frequencies. So if you translate that to the next generation of Rome, you're looking at around 2900 for 3000 megahertz for Rome. That is assuming the percentages remain consistent. And we just don't know that because it's possible that they are being very conservative with these figures and AMD may, in later variants of the silicon, be able to push the clock speed higher. There is a boatload of changes that AMD have managed to uh, plop into the next generation of Zen CPU. So we are not looking at a small percent here of IPC gains that we saw from the original Zen to Zen Plus, which was primarily because of a clock speed boost, which is nothing to do with IPC, of course, and two improvements in cache latency, memory controllers, and blah, 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 blah. That was around 3%. Not awful, but nothing to make you go, gee whiz, I want to upgrade my 1700X to 2700X. With Zen 2, this is very different from what we're hearing, and actually AMD accidentally leaked this information accidentally on purpose, more like. It appears that we're looking at around a 28-29% IPC jump. I would still caution that statement because it's probably highly dependent upon the workload that's being uh, done, and everyone's like, oh, it's 30%. I'm just going to round it up. 30%, 30%. Probably not. I don't think all games, all applications, all uh, tasks are going to be 30%. So that may be better, particularly tasks which really push floating point performance. Don't forget AMD have doubled that for certain workloads. In others, it's probably like more integer related stuff. It's probably not going to be that at all. It's probably going to be more like 10 or 12 or 15%. But I am speculating here. I do not have, you know, that, I really wish it was, but that is not, a 64 core Rome processor, it's not. So I don't have a benchmark to be able to tell you that. But, so, you know, let's let's take the 30% for a moment. That's really impressive. And they've done that through multiple different, uh, multiple different avenues. The first thing they've done is they've improved the execution pipeline. They've doubled the floating point performance to 256 bit. The rumors are as well, that actually has been uh, something they've bolstered through the entire processor. So the data paths and so on have actually been improved. And that's something I will discuss in a future video. But from my understanding from some of the leaks and some of the discussions of some of the folks from AMD in after event conferences and stuff, it's been like 
something they've done for the Infinity Fabric. They've improved, they've just basically increased the performance across the entire chip, which makes sense because otherwise, how are you going to feed the 256 bit floating point, uh, difference that they've got now over the 128 bit? But anyway, they've doubled the core density, improved branch prediction, improved instruction prefetching, reoptimized instruction cache, larger op cache, increased bandwidth and retirement, uh, increased dispatch and retirement bandwidth, excuse me, and really pushed in improving the throughput. The long and short of it is that if you were to look at the IPC gains, they're pretty tremendous. They are tremendous. But you also were to take the uh, 8180 as a point of comparison, the Xeon processor I mentioned a few moments ago, it has a base clock of 2.5 gigahertz. Now, I don't want to compare against uh, AMD for a moment. Instead, I want to compare against like the 8700K or even an older processor like even if you were to go back several generations, like a Haswell or something, the base clocks for those was not 2.5 gigahertz. The point is, there is that massive gap between the two. And if AMD scale this down, I think the highest core count we're realistically going to see for AM4 is going to be like a 16 core, 32 thread, possibly a 12 core, or they may stay at 8 core, which is once again a discussion for a different video. There's no way in heck that they're going to have that as any time type of uh, clock speed. So my guess is once again, 4.7 gigahertz, 4.8 gigahertz for the consumer variant. So the reason I'm mostly discussing this because I've already got a couple of people messaging me on Facebook, asking my opinion whether, you know, we're just going to see like 100-ish megahertz or 150 megahertz jump uh, from one generation of uh, Zen, Zen Pass to Zen 2, and no, I don't think so. I think AMD are being rather conservative right now. I don't think these are final clocks. And even if they are final clocks, they are for the data center, and we're looking at like 64 cores. So heat is definitely gonna be a big problem just because of the sheer density of the actual processor itself. And they also have other concerns as well, like power consumption. Like power consumption is gonna be really high. So obviously you've got power consumption to worry about, heat output to worry about, and all of this stuff, and the sheer density of the processor and the socket. I wouldn't worry about it concerning AM4. We also have some news concerning Zen 3 though, and this is the Pearl Muter Exascale computer developed by Cray. And once again, in a lecture that they were providing, uh, various slides for, they actually revealed a couple of details of the Zen 3 processor. Now, they are not giving clock speeds and, you know, architectural stuff away, but what they have done is give us a couple of tidbits of information we did not have for Zen 3 previously. So, in the slide, which uh, Tom's hardware managed to uh, nab, we see it's a 64 core, but it's possible this could be higher. You see, it's not an exact. It's using a Zen 3 server so NM process. It's an AVX2. Uh, SIMD at 256-bit. It's confirmed to be eight channels with 256 gigabytes per node. And the slingshot connection here is uh, one times 25 gigabytes per second. And we also have com uh, confirmation from this event of something different from NVIDIA, and that is Volta Next, which may give us some architectural uh, signs of what NVIDIA are planning for its roadmap. It's a 7 flop plus device, 32 gigabytes of memory, which is HPM2, NVLink, uh, and this is all combined with one AMD CPU. So <laughs> rather ironically, NVIDIA and AMD are like holding hands on this project and being like, yep, we are the bestest buddies for providing this uh, performance. And each node will contain four of these NVIDIA Volta Next graphics chips. Unfortunately, there's no further details concerning exactly what the layout of the GPU is. So what we do have is a roadmap to know that, hey, Volta Next is the next one. We can probably expect further details at GTC 2019, which of course is not that long away now. I mean, we're basically the end of 2018, which is really crazy to me. I still don't know where the hell this year has gone, but whatever. And while we're on the subject of AMD and graphics cards, we might as well discuss the final specifications of the RX 590, along with some official AMD benchmarks. So for those who are uninitiated, the RX 590 is essentially a refresh of Polaris, but built on a 12NM process. The primary difference here is an increased core clock. So what do we have? Well, this information has come to us through HD Technologica, and the clock speed now appears to be 
up to 1545 megahertz, but custom variants can be up to 1600 megahertz out of the box. There are no changes at all to the memory subsystem, so we're still looking at eight gigabytes of memory, 256 bit, with the same memory uh, clock speed and so on. So now the peak processing power FP32 is 7.1 TFLOPs, which is pretty damn impressive. Supposedly the price for this is gonna be 280 US dollars, which is not too shabby at all. Uh, there have also been, as I mentioned, a couple of slides which have popped out. They confirm the clock speeds and performance that I've just mentioned, but the other one is the actual performance numbers. So the performance numbers that AMD have released are for a myriad of games, and as you can probably imagine, most of those games do heavily benefit AMD graphics cards. They have shown them with uh, HDR enabled esports titles along with standard traditional uh, AAA games without HDR turned on. So Shadow of the Tomb Raider, the GTX 1060 gets 59 frames a second or 70 frames a second with the 580, F1 2018 65 frames a second versus 83 frames a second, Monster Hunter World 50 frames a second, 63 frames a second, uh, there's a 24% jump with Black Ops 4 when HDR is enabled with the 1060 versus the 590. This just jump is slightly smaller with Far Cry 74 frames a second versus 82 frames a second, and so on. So essentially what we are looking at here is a small jump from the 580 to the 590. It's enough to comfortably separate it from the 1060. My personal takeaway with this is that it's not gonna prevent you from buying like a bargain basement 2070 card or a basic 1070 card if you can get one but if you're on the fence and you've got like 250 ish dollars and you must buy new this is a pretty good upgrade and i suspect for 1080p gaming 1440p entry level gaming it's perfect i really wish amd had improved the memory subsystem here and uh it's kind of weird because NVIDIA also had this really good option to uh, use the GP104 cores. Obviously, they've used those for the uh, for the 1060 GDDR5X variant. But for some reason, they just didn't increase the, the CUDA core count. Just 256 additional CUDA cores with a slightly higher memory bandwidth. And they might have actually been able to quite easily hand AMD's butt to them and be like, there you go, there's your butt, would you, would you like that? There you go, there you go, yes, there's your butt AMD. So I, I don't quite know the why they didn't do that, it's a bit of a missed opportunity. So in the mid-range anyway, AMD do have a clear advantage here in terms of price and performance. With that said, it's not helped, it's not hurt any, excuse me, because of FreeSync, but AMD have absolutely zero to counter NVIDIA with in the high end, because whether you buy a 1080, a 2070, a 2080 Ti, a 2080 Vanilla, it's all gravy for NVIDIA because ultimately they're selling you graphics cards. And I'm gonna finish the video with a bit of PlayStation news, specifically a pattern that has been discovered, which shows us a PlayStation 4-like controller, but with a touch screen in the middle of it. This is not exactly new, uh, companies have, of course, used screens in the middle of controllers before. The Dreamcast, technically, I mean, we had the VMU, which... Uh, I, I'm sorry, I have to rant just for just, just a second regarding the Dreamcast and its controllers. Like, I, I never understood. I, I Well, I heard there was a reason uh, Sega did what they did with the Dreamcast controller. I heard it was basically to simplify the design as much as possible, to bring people in who were not necessarily used to gaming. But why one bloody analog stick and the decision to go with the button configuration, like six buttons, plus as well the controls, oh my, the controller felt so uncomfortable to hold. I never understood why Sega did what they did with the, with the Dreamcast controller. It, it was just baffling. Oh, and the biggest thing of all, when the VMU battery ran out, it sounded like it was in pain, like that scream. Ugh. Anyway, um, I'm, I'm sorry, I had to just get that off of my chest. It's just been one of those things that for years has bugged me. But anywho, uh, of course, the Wii U did it as well with its controller. So it's interesting that Sony are doing this. I don't necessarily know how it's gonna work. Maybe it's for like mini games or whatever, and it is just a pattern. A pattern is not, oh look, here's the controller. Maybe as well they could just be doing it and it could be part of the PlayStation 5 for something else. Like, who knows? I mean. The PlayStation 4 controller, which I have one somewhere, but God knows where it is. Oh no, right here. The PlayStation 4 controller, it's like, who uses this? I mean, I kind of did for a little bit, like Killzone in a couple of games, but like, after that I was like, eh, forget it. 
And then I just went back to like the, the normal controls and most game developers did as well. It just kind of felt like a gimmick. And uh, yeah, so I don't know. For me, I, I like a control that's rather basic. And uh, well, yeah. Anyway, um, with all of that said, hopefully you have enjoyed the video, normal stuff. If you did, like, share, comment, and subscribe. And do let me know what type of performance jump you'd like to see in terms of clock speed for Zen 2. And also, your bets. How many cores do you think the mainstream variant, I just want to push that, the mainstream variant of Zen is going to have? Do you feel it's going to be 8, 12, or 16? Because I'm just curious of your thoughts on that one. So do let me know your thoughts. With all of that said, oh, and in case you're wondering what's going on in the background, I'm doing uh, some benchmarks for a graphics card for scientific uh, and 3D rendering because, well, I want to start adding those in to our reviews. With all of that said, hopefully you have enjoyed the video. I'll see you soon. Take care of yourselves. Bye for now.